We are part of the whole. We're the becoming of the universe in every moment. That's an exercise for everyone to do. Lie in the bed at night in the dark and, and realize that there is only the now, only the moment. That the past and future, when you're thinking about them, only exist in the moment. There's only the moment. Lie there in the dark and think about that. So there's only the now. And then if you do it for long enough, what will happen is you will disappear. Because if there's only the now, you can, you're only, you'll find that eventually there is no ego. The ego will disappear. And there will only be the experience of everything else. That's what Satori is. That's what happens. Try it. And and you might and just just remember the one thing to remember, there's no past. The only thing that creates past is our memory. Just think of yourself as a as an entity with no memory. Because you really your memory is just made up most of it. It's baggage. It's Alan Watts says just baggage. Sit there in the lie there in the dark. And this is ha- this happened to me as well uh, another time. And eventually you'll realize you are just everything else. When we last spoke, you said that you were working on a book yourself. Um, yeah. Tell yeah. us about that. I, I keep finding new ideas to incorporate in it. It's putting together my own experience of Satori. Um, so from a what's, you know, some people describe it as a spiritual thing, but, you know, a lot of Zen Buddhists don't consider it spiritual. <laughs> they consider it, it just is. So I had you know, a, an experience, and I was a physicist, and I'd been working, you know, at Bohm's ideas, and I know Stan Groff, Stanislav Groff, uh, was holo- holotropic theory. Uh, I've met Carl, um, Carl Pribram, who's a the neuroscientist who came up with the holonomic theorem of a theory of of conscious of mind, where everything's stored as a hologram in the brain, which I believe is true, and there's a lot of evidence for it. Uh, and then Bohm, and they all work together, those guys. And I've known all of them and um, spoken to all of them. And so my experience that I had was, you know, in line with that. But as a, as a, as a, as a physicist, you want to put something, you want to get some explanation for things. Of course, that's what physicists do. We're, we're always trying to, you know, figure out why you have these experiences. And, and you know, what does that say about the universe? And so I've tried to focus on coming up with with using some of Whitehead's ideas, some of Bohm's ideas, some of uh, Douglas Hostetler's ideas, Groff's, Pribram's, trying to put it all together. And the latest the latest series on black holes and the latest series on, you know, Juan Malcida's uh, anti Sitter conformal field theory, which comes out of string theory, by the way. Um, Time disappears in one of the explanations of the universe, but it's there in another, in the classical, but in the quantum, it doesn't exist. But then I think about the whole idea of the, the hologram being, uh, and this idea that a hologram is just basically a dimensionality less than it's being, the, the thing that's projecting onto it is. So in other words, a lot of theories will say, well, the classical level is not fundamental. It's quantum theory is fundamental. Then some people say, no, classicalism, you know, classical comes out of some deep level of quantum theory. I think it's actually a resonance between the two, that there's a resonance between the two, a resonance between the image, if you like, which is the space-time image we perceive, which we call consciousness, uh, but it's not, right? It's the perception. And the lower dimension of the surface which is the quantum field theory. And in that entangled hierarchy, you get conscious, a global consciousness of which we, as individuals, and I could explain in much more detail, but it takes too long, see only one aspect of it. And so, so, that's, so that's that. So the book is coming along, but I, the trouble is I don't know when to stop. One thing I should add, though, just remember, in my explanations and everything, there's a lot of people interpret a lot of things very differently. So this is my interpretation, having been, you know, looking at this for the past 50 odd years or so. So, um, you know, you'll find many opinions out there, which is good. 
Yeah, no that's one, fine. I, it, on, it, on the other hand, nobody nobody knows nothing really when it comes to consciousness. <laughs> Ian, can you briefly describe the importance of what quantum physics means from a non-materialist point of view? To, to 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 what it means to us as as ordinary human beings. The hard part the hard part is knowing where to start because uh, um, you know if I, it's usually you give some historical perspective to why we came up with the idea. I, I'll I'll just talk about that in very brief terms. In that back at the turn of the nineteen hundreds, you know, into eighteen hundreds into nineteen hundreds, there was you know Max Planck. Um, he realized that you have to talk about quantized energy when describing the uh, thermal curves emitted by what's called a black body, a, a heat source, basically. Um, and then Einstein went further in explaining the uh, what's called the photoelectric effect in saying that the only way to explain the photoelectric effect was an experiment that was done were in the early 1900s was to consider light to be quantized, not only to come as a wave, but also as a particle. So it's really, that was the start of quantum theory that we had to, to explain things, explain experiments. We had, we were forced, physicists were forced to consider um, electromagnetic energy and actually energy in general as being coming in little packets and it wasn't a continuous spectrum. And that's the fundamental basics of that. And then it was up to Bohr to incorporate that into the atomic um, theory of matter uh, to explain atoms in terms of having their energy levels quantized as well. It, it meant that um, these packets of energy, whether they be pure energy, photons or whatever, came in discrete packets of energy that had um, very small energy, but the energy was lumpy. It was lumpy, basically. And, and, uh, and then uh, Heisenberg came up with the uncertainty principle to explain certain aspects of the quantum world, which we couldn't explain classically. There were certain things that in the classical world we could, in practice, in theory, we could measure things to, uh, you know, infinite, infinitesimal amount of accuracy. But in the quantum world, there were certain things you couldn't get accurate together, like the position and momentum of a particle. If you knew exactly the momentum, you didn't know hardly anything about the actual position, and therefore the particle could be anywhere in the universe. So that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And this also applied to energy and time, where energy and time were two things that you couldn't measure exactly together. So if you if you knew the, the uh, exact time, of where a particle was, you didn't know its energy and vice versa. If you knew the exact energy, you didn't know what, what the time frame was for the existence of that uh, particle, which gives rise to some very, very interesting effects in the, in the uh, sort of, uh, quantum world. So that's the basics of it. Now, just to mention, Bohr took it a bit from a different point of view. He said that the idea, because now we're, we're seeing that we could describe partic uh, particles as waves including the electron, um, as a wave and a particle, and light as a wave and a particle. So uh, Bohr took this to mean that basically um, they both complemented each other. Quantum entities weren't really waves and particles. That was the what we got from using classical language about them. In classical language, we use terms like particle and wave. The best we could do in the quantum world, because we couldn't see directly the quantum world and understand it exactly, is to consider that sometimes if we set up the apparatus one way, we get a, 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 it acting as a wave, a quantum entity, and sometimes as a particle. And so that was the uh, Bones complementarity principle. And they were sort of, they were connected. There's a lot of argument about it. So that, and then Schrodinger came along and realized that, you know, what we have to do here is we have to try and put this in a, a strong sort of mathematical grounding. And so he came up with um, describing particles and waves with of a quantum entity, whether that be light or um, matter, 
with the uh, wave function. Well, you know, it, it has different names depending how you treat it. So there was the psi, you know, PSI, and that was the, the wave function that described all the possibilities of a quantum entity or entities. So that's where we are, basically. And so we have this idea that uh, there's the classical world, which we're familiar with, and then there's the quantum world. And the big problem is, of course, and this comes will actually have an effect on us with, when talking about how it relates to humans, is where exactly does the quantum world become the classical world which we are familiar with, which our senses um, perceive? Right, we perceive a classical world of supposedly three dimensions and one of time, and we perceive, uh, you know, objects separated from each other in space and time. That's our classical view of the world, and it's wrong basically. Uh, but, you know, for a long time we try to uh, figure out how does this quantum world, which is potentials and heisenberg said actually that the universe is depends on the question you ask it you're going to get a response from the universe depending on what you're asking it in other words how you set up the exper experimental apparatus and things like that and he described this idea that actually the universe is is full of uh potential like the aristotelian uh idea of potential you know that an artist in a block sees the potential of a statue in there and we you know, depending on what we ask of the universe, we somehow take it from potential to actuality. Now, how does it go from potential to actuality? How does it go from the quantum world to our classical world? So when we're not observing something, we think of a, let's say, a particle, be it uh, a photon or matter, as having many possibilities, which is described by the, the, quant the uh, wave function. And that wave function as it evolves in time, you know, it spreads, the possibilities spread. It's deterministic, it spreads deterministically all the, all the potential possibilities for this particle as time goes on. And when, um, when we observe it, and observation is a very tricky thing in quantum theory, but let's just say when we interact with it, then it becomes somewhere, it becomes an actual value of something that we want. It becomes an actual position or an actual momentum or an actual energy, that sort of thing that we can now consider in our classical world. So that's that's a sort of picture. Um, but, you know, once we stop observing it, then it could start the wave function possibilities can, can, can spread again. And then if you observe it, it can collapse. So it's it's almost like in between observations, and, and I'm not defining what an observation is yet, but let's say interactions, the quantum particle, the quantum world seems to just spread with possibilities, possibilities, all the potential possibilities out there. And then once, and it could be anywhere in the universe, it could have any momentum, this, that, and the other. And then when we measure it to measure one aspect of it, like its position or its momentum, it boom, suddenly collapses. And that's it um, until we measure it again. But no one knows what actually causes that collapse. And John von Neumann, who was, I would put him at the genius level of Einstein, and he's, he's not well known, but he was a brilliant Hungarian mathematician who actually worked on this and he considered that the the thing that actually collapses the wave function is a conscious observer. Um, he traced it all the way back mathematically. He said it has to be a conscious observer. And still nobody knows that. And in fact, from Bohr's point of view, there really was no collapse. And in Bohm's uh, causal interpretation of quantum theory, there is no collapse. In the GRW, Gerardi, uh, Remedy, Web, Weber, or Weber, Weber, um, interpretation is a random collapse in the universe at uh, different times. Uh, Roger Penrose thinks it's um, the brain. Um, Amit Goswami has his own idea, which is brilliant as well, which I, uh, I've forgotten the, all the details of that. It's very clever. Uh, so there's many different people try, trying to figure out the collapse, where the collapse comes in.
Um, Henry Stapp, another theoretical physicist, brilliant chap, he, he thinks it's also occurring in the brain, but it's not caused it's just by the brain. It's, it's, it's the whole universe making the decision. Exactly. So, and so that's brilliant. That is a fantastic summary of decades of scientific development and work. Can we actually say the new age process, the, the new age thinking that says the, the way function collapses, there's a, a an experience that takes place. It, it's, it, we experience form out of the possibility, and therefore we are creating our own experience of reality. Can that can that expression actually be applied to the science that you've just described, or has that been taken out of context? from the science. The thing about physicists, uh, you ask a physicist uh, uh, that sort of question, you're going to get 100 physicists, you're going to get 100 answers. Basically, there's different camps that people come down in. The, um, Einstein and, uh, you know, was a critical realist who believed that um, there was an objective universe out there separate from humans, although it's not exactly as we perceive it. That's a critical realist. And there's all subsections. And if you talk to right. Philosophy for hours talking about this. And um, um, Stephen Hawking, for example, was a positivist, uh, which is a, a stance where, well, you're never, it depends on the type of positive, positivist you are. But basically, science is all about you know, building models and trying to explain the universe in terms of what we perceive basically. Uh, so, you know, they don't, positivists will say, well, we don't know reality. We can just build a model uh, that explains the perceptions we have of it. So, uh, you know, there's, there's the two big camps. There's the, no, we're just observers in this vast universe. And we are you know, we we don't collapse. And then there's subdivisions of that. Some think we, even though that we collapse the wave function and others believe now, a lot of people believe in decoherence, which is no, it's just the collapse of the wave function occurs when the quantum particle starts interacting with the environment, like fo other photons, you know, uh, other quantum particles and get entangled with those. Because when quantum particles interact, they entangle, and I think everyone's heard about entanglement by now in terms of quantum computers. So, I mean, you know, when you take two particles that are entangled apart, if you affect this one, it automatically instantaneously affects this one, that sort of thing. And so gradually the, the quantum nature of the particle bleeds into the environmental classical background. And so that's another way of collapsing it. So it's not the observer doing it. We could, as an observer, collapse it, certainly. Um, by observing it, but so can the environment. We're part of the environment. So can a, a measurement, a measurement machine. So we can, machines can, the environment can. Um, just a note about decoherence. So the founders, there's a very good book out there, got back here somewhere, that decoherence is, is, a, is a, does not explain the collapse of the wave function. All it does, it says that the particle becomes entangled with everything. But that quantum wave function just gets bigger and bigger in the sense that now you're, for example, if a, if a quantum particle is measured by a piece of apparatus, it becomes entangled with that piece of apparatus. So the, supposing the quantum particle has two states. Well, one state will be, you know, this quantum particle with this machine now, that's, that's, that's a one state. And then the other one, this particle in a different state with this machine. So now you're just building out these different quantum wave functions are getting bigger and bigger because they're including all the different uh, uh, factors in the environment. So even the founders of decoherence say that, generally speaking, there's no in de decoherence, there's no ultimate explanation of what collapses, if it, indeed it does, collapses a wave function into a classical thing. So those are that, that camp. And then on the other side, with the people who believe that the brain collapses the wave function into a classical reality that we observe, uh, there's Penrose that believes it's um, 
in the brain, there's uh, you know microtubules that hold the state of the the, uh, the quantum state of whatever you're observing into all its many many possibilities. So again, if imagine you had a quantum particle in two different states, making it simple, the, there would be two brain states, and because these brain states have different energy levels, they're going to have different curvatures of time, and then eventually, when this becomes significant enough, the whole universe effectively through the, the uh, gra- some sort of gravitational interaction will collapse it into one state because uh, the universe doesn't like having two curved time states, you know, and so it collapses it when it gets to a certain energy level. That's Pe- Penrose's um, and, um, oh, Stuart Hameroff's sort of uh, theory about that. And then there's so there's there's quite a few. The criticism often about the brain collapsing being a quantum effect and then collapsing it in a quantum way in the brain, not just through a, a quick observation, but continually holding this quantum state in the brain, uh, is that the it's subject to a lot of uh, decoherence in the brain. The quantum state when it gets decohered uh, and it gets you know smeared out. Um, that you know you can't maintain a pure quantum quantum state then because of the heat basically in the brain and so the arg- argument is that the brain can't do it but i th- i think as as um, henry stapp pointed out that you could still deal with what's called mixture states so those are the things you've got the the more physicalist type classical you know type of things and then you've got the observer things so if you are on the side of the you know, the, the quantum state is sort of collapsed in the brain, going from a pure quantum state down to, you know, actuality, then yes, that is, you know, that that is our experience. Somehow the brain is taking all these possibilities, and, and um, Amit Goswami includes this as well, takes all these possibilities of of what these, these the quantum states could be for our observation, and then collapses it down to one. So it's rather like, as Alan Turing said, where we are a um, a quantum amplifier in some ways. We take the quantum world and amplify it up, and then make it into the classical world somehow. We're like a we're like an antenna, you know, that's tuning into a field, and we're we're taking this field that has all the potentialities of everything that let's call it a, a call it a quantum field. Call it, well, call it the wave function field. And it's like tuning in your radio into electromagnetic waves you there's all these you know hundreds thousands millions of different frequencies coming in and we tune it down to one we select one so is it like that i mean sheldrake thinks it is as well uh, rupert sheldrake so in that case we're sort of more we're more like part of the system with that particular aspect and so what we experience what we experience if we believe that we humans, human consciousness or consciousness in general collapses the wave function uh, from possibility to actuality, we are part of the whole, basically. We're the becoming of the universe in every moment. That's what we experience. And that's for a very Zen sort of Satori like thing, you know, that we collapse in every moment. And so presumably David Bohm was more in line with your latter description there. Yes, what it did come out of uh, Bohm's uh, causal interpretation was that there is an aspect, if you put the wave function into a different polar form, there is a term in it that has the wave function in both the uh, denominator and numerator, so it makes it nonlinear. And this turned out to be, if you rewrite that and do some fancy math, then you can show that this is effectively the quantum potential. Um, it was also non-local in that the quantum potential connected everything in the universe. So a single electron would be connected to everything else in the universe. So its path, its trajectory, its um, very being. So it had an actuality, an electron. It had an actual position at all times. Um Bohm's basically his cause interpretation was non-local. It was a whole. It made the universe, um, this quantum potential existed throughout the universe. It's like a field, if you like. It's like a, 
it was like a guiding field. So, for example, when a ship comes into a harbour, it's often guided by radar. The radar itself is non-local, it's all over the place, but it guides the ship. And um, so with, with Bohm, he went on to come up with the idea of the implicate and expert explicate orders and in that he he posited that basically brain and matter come into existence together it's like the buddhist co-arising of mind and matter and you couldn't separate them they were both fundamental aspects of the universe i don't think he'd say so much that it happens in the brain because he thinks that i'm pretty sure he thought the consciousness was non-local but i can't be sure but it, it was all part of the same thing. There's there's this um, expression uh, that, I, again, I think it's more used by people such as myself rather than science, but this expression of the intelligent ether, so that, which really is that wave function um, field that you're talking about. But but the the you know, and we interact with it, and and in that process that you've just described, you know, we there's that interaction, the feedback loop, if you like, of mind and mat, you know, matter co coexisting at the same time, is a result of the interaction of of our awareness, whatever consciousness is, interacting with the intelligent ether, collapsing it into form. Um, and I and I think Goswami goes along. That's that's part of his thinking as well i think really where we're talking yeah. about these constant feedback loops of um parallel and, yes. and paradoxical um formation in Hierar you know, yeah hierarchical yeah um, interactions uh, feedback yeah loops. yeah i can't remember exactly yeah, yeah. um uh amit amit's um you know i know amit i mean he came and talked to my class and everything in hawaii and i, I think his theory is Brilliant. Uh, I just can't remember all the details about it because it's a little involved. But I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to um, talk about that. The, the thing, the first thing I, I just want to say is that I, I think the biggest, the problem with trying to explain consciousness, I don't see a lot of people think that there is only one consciousness and, you know, and that's what we experience. And we, we're an aspect of that. And, 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 um, Rupert Spear, of course, is a brilliant speaker, and he talks about this. He, and I, I'm not saying he's saying that exactly, but he talks about it in a slightly different way. We're just one aspect. We're one um, sort of uh, aspect of this great consciousness. So I don't think we can experience the great consciousness, but we are one aspect of it. And so we see things, and I think this is what Rupert talks about, we see things as more splintered in, into our own perspectives and things like that. So the thing is, we've got to be careful when we talk about the wave function and being the consciousness and things. These are terms that are, are so have so different meanings to everybody. Is the wave function actually real? Even some physicists who believe that there's an objective reality out there, there's a subject and object, you know, they don't think, they think it's just a pure mathematical formalism for calculating things. One thing I do believe, so I'll say my, my sort of belief. So the first thing we have to get rid of, and there's a brilliant book, called The Brain from the Inside Out by a, a brilliant neuroscientist uh, called uh, Yogi Bazaki. It's a book worth reading, and there's been a lot of research done on the hippocampus and the brain now by, I think it's John O'Keefe, who found that in rat brains and human brains, there's place cells and grid cells that allow us to form a space-time sort of representation of the environment but it's produced in the hippocampus. In other words, the hippocampus produces our idea of space and time. And it's almost like a little hologram in, in, in there as well. And Bazaki goes on uh, to point out that the hippocampus is the thing that lays down long-term memories. And that's why when we sleep, it's, it's reinforcing those memories. Space time is a, is a nice, convenient way of saying when, how, what sort of thing. And he goes on to say, well, basically, uh, our ex well, I wouldn't say our experience, but our idea of space-time is one way of representing reality in our brains. So the idea of space and time are concepts in our brains, which is Einstein pretty much said the same, actually, after special relativity. He said that um, vision was an optical delusion 
not an illusion, an optical delusion, because he said it makes us feel separate from everything. If we didn't have vision, we'd be far more feeling connected with the wholeness. But going back to the idea about the strange lips, so that, that sets that problem up. First of all, what on earth is consciousness and how does it arise and things like that? This idea about the strange loops, um, which uh, Douglas Hofstadler, you know, he wrote the book Gerd Lischer and Bach. It comes originally the idea of these entangled hierarchies from Gödel. I don't know if it's originally from Gödel, but he produced, he showed that in mathematics, um, there are certain truths in math mathematics that no formalistic method or proof could ever prove such theorems. There are mathematical truths out there that no computer, no algorithmic, no formalistic procedure can prove certain truths to be, all right? And the way he proved this was by using a metamathematics. And in the metamathematics, in the, the metamathematics he talked about math mathematics, and he produced this, this paradoxical loop. Then Alan Turing came along, and, and with the Alonzo Church, um, you know, together they they form this uh, the Church uh, Turing hypothesis that goes on to say there's undecipherable propositions in, in computer science. So there are numbers out there that a computer can never generate, for example. So there's this idea of uh, that if you're in the system, sometimes you can't prove the system. There's a great quote from uh, Lyle Watson in his book, Supernature, back in the 70s, I think it was. If the brain was so simple we could understand it, we'd be so simple that we couldn't. You know, so Penrose points out humans, human consciousness, can understand certain mathematical, can understand mathematical truths that a machine or an algorithm, it could not. So in other words, he believes the brain is non-computational. So this, because we can understand uh, mathematical truths that um, an algorithm couldn't. So this comes from this sort of entangled hierarchical thing as well, that we, that all, all of them, Gödel, uh, Escher and Bach. If you look at Escher's drawings, and I think in uh, Amit Goswami's book, he points out the, um, oh, what's the, 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 the image of the person in a gallery looking at painting, and then in the painting, it's it's him looking at himself. So it's self-referential. So these self-referential loops, mm -hmm. the entangled hierarchical loops, are very important uh, in intelligence. You know, like thing. I am a liar. That's a paradoxical statement, right there, right? So, so the thing about these entangled hierarchies, and I'll give you an example of entangled hierarchy that I like to give, is that individuals, right, we have our own consciousness and our own awareness and, and that, so we think. But we interact with each other, so there's an interaction of ourselves to produce a higher um, level called society or culture. Now, so we go from a lower uh dimensionality if you like of individuals to a higher one being um society but society interacts back on the individual to control it so individuals interacting create society but society plays back on the individuals so it's a, a lower level system interacting to produce a higher level system then then acts back on the lower system now that produces this feedback system going from a higher level to a lower level actually creates a another sort of system that's outside of the loop. Some people think that's consciousness, actually. We wouldn't be consciousness if we weren't interacting with each other. Consciousness is not purely created in the brain. So this is partly why I think Penrose believes this as well, that that jump out of the loop produces a higher level that can see truths that an algorithm that's stuck in the loop or is part of the loop cannot see. That's one way of looking at it. And it's um, that's my take on it, and that's my belief. Interestingly, there's, there's a theory out there now called, um, and of course it comes from the holographic principle uh, about black holes. And it's been um, uh, one Mal Malacena, 
who's a brilliant theoretical physicist, came up about 20 odd years ago with this new theory, relatively new in physics, 20 years ago is new in physics, called ADS uh, CFT theory, which is anti de Sitter conformal field theory, where um, he, he's able to show, and I'll just tell you what the theory is, he's able to show that that the explanation of the universe is a dual theory, where on the boundary of the universe exists the quantum explanation. And in the bulk, what's called inside, is space and time. So in other words, he says that both quantum field theory and general relativity are both explanations of reality in this model universe he's created. It's not our universe, it's a similar one. Uh, but it turns out that um, it's a holographic theory because on the boundary, you're at a lower dimension. You're a surface. In the bulk, you're an extra dimension up, a three-dimensional volume. And so it's very interesting because I'm talking about, when I talk about people interacting together at a low level to form a higher level, that's actually a jump. In some ways, that's a jump from a... Um, higher level dimensionality to a lower level dimensionality. So for example, an ordinary hologram, if you were to take a hologram of uh, me right now, and I'm in three dimensions, it's actually projected onto two dimensional space. So a hologram is actually a reduction of dimensionality. That's all it is. So it's information stored in a dimension one down. Now with uh, one Maldecidas, um, ADS CFT theorem, theory, it's the same thing. And in the holographic principle of the black hole, then information is you know, stored on the event horizon. And inside is like a projection of what we see as reality, three dimensions and time. On the outside, there's no time. There's just quantum field theory. And they both, ex they both, they both explain reality. You could, you can, but the interesting thing about this is that it's like a strange loop in some ways. If you don't take it purely as dual, that there's an interaction between them, perhaps. And it's like people going to society and then society playing back. If that were the case in this theory, you'd have a theory of the universe, which is a strange loop, one big strange loop, that, that one creates the other and then feeds back into the other. That's not exactly what uh, one Malcedes talk, Maldacena is talking about, but it could be. So I do believe that this idea of the strange loop, this feedback tang -tang -tang entangled hierarchy, is actually very fundamental to consciousness and very fundamental to reality. So we're getting complex and complexities that feed back in, and we get this entangled thing. So I think there's more work to be done there. And I think that we, I personally think we'll find that when we start looking more deeply at the interaction between the quantum world and the classical world, we'll see it more as a dual theory as Malcedes, Maldacenas thinks. And that interaction will actually, in my opinion, actually creates, creates consciousness. It's a level that's created outside a global consciousness. That's what I would call holographic resonance. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. I, I think I was just about staying, staying with you there. Um, is it, 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 it would that because in a way, what you're describing there is what I have heard described as emergence theory. So where, where one layer sort of emerges from another. Maybe you haven't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. Well, I think emergence emergence level is not quite the same thing. Huxley called the smoke above the factory. Uh -huh. You know, consciousness is like the smoke above the factory. It emerges. Wetness of water emerges. So it's slightly different. Uh, another way of thinking about it is the wetness of water emerges from the complexity, the interaction of molecules. Right. If we feel water to be wet, right. but it, wetness doesn't really exist. It's an emergent property from the combination of a lower level of interactions of molecules. H2O. Right. Uh, so that's what they talk about, consciousness emerging from interaction of neurons. And there's a great book by uh, Stuart Kauf Kaufman, 
at Home in the Universe, where he talks about sort of an emergent uh, idea where the interaction, when you get to a certain level of complexity, it produces a, another emergent property, which is life and then possibly consciousness. So emergency and uh, entangled loops might be related. You, you've done a great job of um, really um, kind of laying down the foundations of, of, of quantum physics, really, which is what I wanted you to do. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Take care. Take care.